Welcome to the Shaping Design Podcast, where we help you get better at design through stories, strategies, and tactics. I'm Mitchell Bernstein. Today, I'd like to talk to you about something that's been on my mind for a little bit and that I've been tweeting a little bit about taste, specifically design taste. And this is something I think designers are a little eager to understand more about because without this, you really can't be a good designer, in my opinion. And it's one thing to just follow steps and actions that others have given you like a manual of an ikea chair or something like that but it's very important for you to understand how this works because if you don't then it can be catastrophic for your work and if you do the benefits are astronomical right so you can actually get more money people will like your style a lot more which means they'll probably go to you for more work so get more clients if that's what you're trying to aim for you can actually craft things more specifically towards a specific style when you're doing design work for a client it actually is very beneficial and it also trends into your day-to-day life so i want to talk about taste and we'll start from the very beginning and i have a lot of notes you know what is taste and if you go on to google and you type in what is taste then you're going to get a definition that's along the lines of the sensation of flavor perceived in the mouth and throat on contact with a substance and an example is that wine had a fruity taste. Not exactly what we're looking for here. It has some sort of subjective feeling, but there is still something objective about it. Like wine is going to taste like wine. It's not going to taste like necessarily a mango, right? Unless it's a mango flavored wine, which sounds gross. But my point is, there's actually uh, something there being subjective and objective. And I'm going to get into that in a second. I Googled again some more of this stuff, like what is taste, and I added what is design taste. An article came up by this dude or dudette, I'm not sure, Rahadian. They said, taste in graphic design is based on aesthetic artistic considerations. Aesthetic considerations, according to Immanuel Kant, one of the world's most famous thinkers, Our considerations based on one's liking for what is regarded excellent, beauty, beautiful, attractive, and so on. Honestly, that definition I didn't really like because that kind of said aesthetic is what you consider beautiful. And I don't really know what to make of that. It's like just saying something is the thing it is. So I did a little bit of a deep dive and I asked ChatGPT, what does Immanuel Kant say about aesthetics? It turns out Immanuel Kant actually has a lot of literature on the subject of taste. It's called Critiques of Judgment. That's what he uses to his body of work that he wrote to discuss this. And I asked a little bit of what his thoughts were to ChatGPT, which is amazing that you can talk to a body of work and that body of work can then react to you. So I'm going to read a little bit about this, might be a little bit lengthy, but I think it's really important for you to understand the full perspective of where I'm coming from on this, because in my opinion, and apparently in my Kant's, there are two pieces to aesthetic taste, if you will. Number one is there's an objective truth to it. And then number two is there's a subjective bias to it. So I'm going to read his kind of stuff right now. And then we'll discuss that in a minute. Immanuel Kant is what ChatGPT said. I asked it, summarize for me in a single paragraph, Immanuel Kant's thoughts on aesthetic and taste. Immanuel Kant, in his seminal work, Critique of Judgment, explored the philosophy of aesthetics and taste, arguing that appreciation of beauty is not based on personal preference, but rather a universal sense of taste. According to Kant, aesthetics judgments are subjective in nature, yet they carry a presumption of universal judgment. He distinguished between free beauty, which does not presuppose a concept of what the object should be, and dependent beauty, which presupposes, is a lot of very big words, such a concept. For Kant, an object is deemed beautiful when it presents a harmonious interplay between the faculties of imagination and understanding. Beauty is not a property of the object itself, but a relationship between an object and the perceiver eliciting a pleasurable feeling that transcends personal bias and cultural differences. And I'm not going to get into all the other stuff, but he talks about that there is an interplay between the both the objective and the subjective nature of aesthetics and taste. And then also that 
the objective part is a universal truth. There's things that exist and you're either playing into those things. We like to call those principles of design when we're talking about design. So for us, there are things that we can point to and say, okay, this is an objective truth. There's data that backs it. There's common our, our common. There's data that backs it. There's already a common understanding of why this is why it is. And some things don't change very easily over time, probably because they're very tested and true. Some things are just less understood and people just stick to the defaults. But for a lot of things in design, like understanding how to move someone's eye around a screen or around a paper or whatever medium you're working with and you're designing with, you have principles that you can adhere to that help create a sense of aesthetics from your perspective. And you have to be able to craft your perspective through your work. That's pretty much what I'm getting at. So I put a tweet out that discussed how should we develop our own design taste and not your taste buds. I don't really want to know anything about that. But a couple people like Noman Designs said, by spending one fourth of my screen time browsing Arena and Mobile Designs and curating sespocket.com, Noman is suggesting to develop your taste, you need to spend time actually reading other people's curations. And I think those critiques are very helpful for you. So totally agree with that. Except I would say a lot of people today just have a list of maybe decent design work but they don't really tell you what's great about it. They say there might be a property that's like great footer or really great header of this website or really great app icon. These are great ways to find great design, but they don't really tell you why it's great. But that's a great suggestion to be able to spend time and immerse yourself in that. Benjamin Hope said iteration. Just that word, totally agree with it. John Allen said theft. And I think it's really great. It goes along the lines with the Pablo Picasso quote which is good artists take, great artists steal, or good artists copy, great artists steal, excuse me. And some other responses like Shane Levine, Levin, please let me know if I said that wrong, sorry. Consume design constantly, live in a design focused place, steal, copy, and replicate great design. What's interesting about this tweet was live in a design focused place. So I don't think Shane necessarily means live in a house made of glass and materials that appear in your visual aesthetics that you build for your UI. I think, though, immersing yourself culturally in a place that can expose you to new ideas about design or traveling to places that have really great aesthetics, or maybe even it can expose you to just new ideas that you can merge into new things is a very helpful thing, very helpful thing to do. It sounded weird on face value, live in a city. Like, I think that something like that might not be the best for everyone. Because I know a lot of great designers, some that have been on this podcast, they don't live in a city. I used to live in a city. I don't like it. I live outside of a city. And I think it's too busy for me. But I do understand that you're passing by so many different things, like people who have different clothing that's just so unique. People who have great you know, taste in signage, people have great taste in cars and all that stuff. So I do think that there's something there. And so now I'm going to give you a little breakdown of how can you actually develop your taste with ideas that I think are more sound and more prepared and can help you get a little bit further in this. Because if you don't, again, if you don't do this well, chances are your design is not going to be visually good, which is 90% 90% right of many designs right if it's worked really well great but like sometimes it has to look really well so how do you actually develop your taste your design taste your design sensibility how do you create that if you don't already have it or how do you make it better this is something I'm actually going to be implementing myself I'll be tweeting a lot more websites that I think have really great design and I'm going to explain to you why I think these websites have great design a lot of people have been putting out threads of websites that honestly, it's just like a list of 40 websites and there's like maybe one sentence. I think that's a good start, but that's not really teaching people too much. I think we can be succinct, but also create more in-depth curation or critiques of websites and, and apps and whatever. So I'll be releasing some really great posts on that soon, really great threads on that, tweets, whatever you call them. But for this podcast, this episode, I'm gonna give you a couple of things that I've now assimilated into one 
rubric for you to be able to follow to actually craft your own sensibility of design, your own taste. So number one, if you can learn to spot the difference between your judgment, your personal bias, and the expected judgment of the thing, I think that you might have the ability to start to decipher for yourself, what can you apply your taste to? Let's say you have a need to design something like an app for a train station or something. You probably will look at other train station apps and see what do they have, what functionality they have that others need that you need to replicate. And you also would probably be talking to the users and like the stakeholders and whatever, but when you're working, you're in your work mode, you're not in like the discussion phase or the brief phase, whatever you call it, you're probably going to be doing your own research. And in this research, you probably want to be able to compare what do competitors do and what. And if you're going to be saying, okay, people like this app, but I don't like it. Why don't I like it? And why do so many others like it? Maybe there's some sort of fine line that kind of interplay that Immanuel Kant was referring to that can help you craft your taste, craft your sensibility. It's not necessarily about functionality. It's not necessarily not about functionality. But in this case, I'm only trying to highlight that you need to be able to balance decision making that comes from personal inference, personal experiences, your just reactions versus data versus other people's reactions, being able to step back and look at it from a much higher, a much farther perspective, like the 10,000 foot versus the up close 10 inches view, right? If you're able to compare those two together and see them and see if they kind of align, then I think that'll help you figure out what is your taste? What can you bring to the table? Because then you can supplement what others are saying and thinking and what you are saying and thinking, and then align those together to create something really great. So number two, curation. I think this is a great step because if you're able to curate, you're able to understand why things work and why some things don't. For example, I'm going to be curating a bunch of websites because I want to get better at web design and maybe some mobile app design or whatever, but I want to get better at designing websites for this example. And in order to do that, I need to understand what works in a lot of websites and what does not work in a lot of websites. Understanding those two pieces will help me figure out, okay, when I'm going to make those same decisions, how can I take the best of the best and then leave out the worst parts of those things to create something that's even better for the use cases I'm applying them to? See how that works? I think it's really important that if you're able to curate and actually do the curation and sit there and critique and understand and break down what those things are, they don't even have to be about what works and what doesn't. It's just things that you've noticed, things that maybe t turn on your eyes to pay attention more to, things that might make others happy, the things that you know is getting a lot of attention in some specific manner or for a specific reason. All these pieces and other things that I haven't mentioned can help you curate something. And by curating it and critiquing it further, you're able to take those lessons and apply them to what you're doing. So number three, immerse yourself in new ideas, new experiences even. Sometimes people say, if you don't live a life worth living, how can you really be interesting? How can you really be someone to talk to? You can be pretty boring. Some people are actually very good at talking and they're just really a, a life of the party, for example. But if you don't have great experiences, what are you going to talk about? The weather all day? No. You have to be exposed to new ideas and be able to say, hey, I'm going to visit this place that might be really good at this one or two things. Like, I don't know. If you go to Japan, you're going to find a lot of minimalism. So minimalism is really a, a high-profile aesthetic in Japan, and they definitely champion it pretty well. So if you go to visit that, you might actually experience new ideas within minimalism that you might want to replicate in your own work. The same thing if you go to New York City in, or, or rural America or something, you're able to expose yourself to signage, clothes, architecture, things that you might not be able to get where you are. So being able to visit, immerse yourself, museums, local museums even, museums, local museums even, if you're able to find places that can help bring things to you, 
and online too, right? Like all these other websites that are already curating things, spend time on them, interact with people who are also commenting on some of those posts on those websites or join different Facebook groups, Twitter, whatever they're called. I don't know if the communities are even a thing anymore. Join different paid groups even and talk to people who have different ideas or who are making things in that same space who can expose you to new ideas. And for our last iteration, being able to constantly make is, I think, probably out of all the things, the most important. I had a conversation with a very famous graphic designer. He was a partner at Pentagram. His name is Michael Beirut. I cornered him at AIGA conference once. I won't get into the story of this episode, but maybe something else, something down the line I'll talk about. And I asked him, how do I get to be your level? Like, how do I get to your level in being a partner at a high-end agency or whatever? And he gave me really a really great set of answers, but I'm going to share one of those answers with you. And that is to make bad shit, make a ton of bad shit. Most of the work that you do for the first half of your career is going to suck. I'm sorry to say this, but you're not going to be good when you first start. There's no chance you're going to be that good. You might be able to get by and make money, but you're not going to be the best. Okay. Just flat out. I'm saying it. I'm not the best. I'm not that good. I don't think I'm very good but I think I can be really great. And in order to do that, I need to create a lot of stuff and get feedback. Feedback shows you where you've fallen short. It shows you where your strengths are. A lot of people on Dribbble will just say, oh my God, I love the work. And I like the support. I think it's important to have the support, but it's also important to not ignore criticisms of your work when you put it out into the world. When you put it out into the world though, that is already the first step. So congratulate yourself if you're able to do that. So in essence, uh, what I'm trying to get at is if I'm going on a tangent here, you have to create a lot of work, share it with the world and see what the world says. Okay, you don't have to agree with all the feedback. But by listening and taking it in, you're able to further build on your design skills, and then develop your own taste, develop your own perspective. Because in my opinion, taste is a perspective that you have and only you have an AI cannot have a taste. It's given orders you need to develop your taste in order to stay relevant against AI. AI, does, it will never have good taste because you have to give it something that might be ironic, might be su subliminal, so, so might be in parallel, might be on the nose, on the bullseye, descriptive of the characteristics of what you're trying to create around. So if you don't have your taste, you're not really a good designer, in fact, you're not really much of a designer at all. But if you do have your taste, you're able to conquer so much more, design so much better, be more useful, actually be able to put great work out into the world. And there's no shame in trying to do that and failing. But there is shame in trying to do that and failing and saying that you're you have the best taste. Most people don't have good taste. But these are the steps that you should take to develop your taste and get better at it as much as I'm trying to get better at my taste. And hopefully soon my taste will be really high up there and just as much as yours will be really high up there too. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening and please subscribe to us on YouTube. Subscribe and follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you listen to this podcast. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.